Hello, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Laura Rosenberger. I'm director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy and a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund and your moderator for today. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce our special guests, David Scheimer and John Brennan, both of whom I've had the pleasure of working with. David is the author of Rigged, America, Russia, and 100 Years of Covert Electoral Interference. His foreign policy reporting has appeared in such publications, including the New York Times, The New Yorker, and Foreign Affairs. David is pursuing a doctorate in international relations at the University of Oxford as a Marshall Scholar. He is an associate fellow of Davenport College at Yale University, where he received his undergraduate and master's degrees in history. I got to know David when he was interning on Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. John Brennan is a distinguished fellow at the Center on National Security and Fordham Law School and a distinguished scholar at the University of Texas at Austin. He was director of the Central Intelligence Agency when we spent many hours together in the Situation Room and previously served as assistant to the president for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. A specialist in Middle Eastern Affairs and Counterterrorism, John has received several awards for his many professional contributions, including the National Security Medal, National Intelligence Distinguished Public Service Medal, and FBI Director's Medallion. Please join me in welcoming David Scheimer and John Brennan. David, I'd like to plunge right in today. Congratulations on the release of the book. But before we get to the, some of the specific aspects, can you just give us an overview of what the book is about? And I think, importantly, why you wanted to write about this topic? Um, absolutely. And, 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 and first, I do just want to say thank you both for, for being here. And, and I'm really, really excited to talk about these issues in my book with you. Um, I, I would say that I wrote this book um, because after 2016, after Russia attacked our democracy, I found it bizarre, if not dangerous, that that operation was sort of treated as unprecedented and novel because when something's unprecedented, that means that there's no history to it. And when there's no history to something, it becomes really easy to create myths and misconceptions about something, to manipulate something, to suit whatever agenda you're seeking to advance. So, so I sought to provide that history, and I ended up spending years going through archives and interviewing relevant individuals to recreate the history before Russia's 2016 operation. And what I do in this book is um, I map out the century-long story of covert electoral interference. I show how the Soviet Union, as well as the United States, have used their intelligence services to interfere in elections all over the world, how Putin's Russia has now rediscovered and enhanced that idea in interfering in elections all over the world. I then look at 2016 um, in detail, but as part of that history, and then use all of that um, background and past to, to chart out a path forward for, for the future, um, not informed not only by 2016, but everything that came before it is, is the general purpose of the book and is why I felt like it really just needed to be written. Thanks, David. It's a super interesting um, historical look. And I think putting putting this issue into historical context is, as you said, something that was really necessary. Director Brennan, I'd like to pick up on that. Um, the unclassified version of the January 2017 intelligence community assessment of Russia's interference in the 2016 election found that, quote, Russia's effort to influence the 2016 U.S. presidential election represented a significant escalation in directness, level of activity, and scope of effort compared to previous operations aimed at U.S. elections. Could you elaborate on how Putin's recent efforts differ from the past? Well, Laura, it's good to be with you again, if only virtually, and I'm very pleased to be able to participate in this virtual event. Um, because David has written, I think, an excellent book, very well researched, very well written, and I think it really does add to the literature, not just about what happened in 2016, but also in the years before. Um, yes, what happened in 2016, as far as Russian interference in our election was concerned, um, from my perspective, it did um, demonstrate a much more robust, intense, and uh, wide-ranging effort on the part of the Russians. Partly, that's because of all of the opportunities that exist within the digital domain to cause problems, whether it be to go in and get emails and disseminate them, uh, as well as to use social media platforms. Uh, but there was a real determination, I felt, that uh, Putin had to try to really undermine Hillary Clinton's prospects in the election and to help Donald Trump. So it seemed as though there was a a very wide-ranging effort on the part of the Russian intelligence services, specifically the GRU, but also working with various other mechanisms, such as the Internet Research Agency, 
to have a full court press, if you will, uh, particularly in the last six or nine months before the election. And uh, it, so it, the, the, the social media aspect of it, I think, was the one that was probably most, not surprising, but the, the newest element of the Russian effort. We know that the Russians are very, very sophisticated when it comes to operating in the cyber domain. And so I, I think what we saw in 2016 was a, a real effort on the part of Putin to try to do what he could to undermine the integrity of that election, as well as to try to tip the balance uh, so that the outcome would be one that would be more favorable to him. Thanks. And that's actually consistent with one of David's findings that he writes about in the book, is that while much of the IRA's tactics were similar to Soviet efforts during the Cold War, the key differentiator was technology. Um, David, I don't know if you want to elaborate on both what the similarities were um, and, and why the technology piece made such the difference in your mind. Sure. So, so I would argue that Nothing about Vladimir Putin's operation was original, but all of it was was an enhanced version of, of what his predecessors had done and, ha in certain instances, what our country had done. And, and, and breaking that out into three components, um, well, first were the objectives, which was to sow discord, to help Donald Trump and to hurt Hillary Clinton. The KGB interfered in our electorate, in our politics to accomplish those three aims, to sow discord, help the people they liked, hurt the people they didn't for, for a generation. The Russian GRU targeted our voting systems in order to access them, penetrate them, and open them up to manipulation. In the post-war period, Joseph Stalin's uh, and his um, fellow travelers manipulated voting systems across Eastern Europe. In recent years, Russia has targeted voting systems in countries like Ukraine. So again, this is just the application of an old idea to the United States. The second was taking what was private private information about individuals in John Podesta and the Democratic National Committee and making them public. So, so abolishing the line between what's personal and what's in the public arena. Again, that's an old KGB idea. In the, in the 1976 presidential election, the KGB created a forgery um, about the personal life of Henry Scoop Jackson, a presidential candidate, and sought to send it to media outlets to publicize what they claimed was his private life in order to destroy his political career. Um, what the internet afforded Russia the opportunity to do was instead of having one forgery to have tens of thousands of real documents and rather than having to send them to newspapers to just upload them online through through WikiLeaks as, as a third party cutout. And the third was social media, which which seems the most novel and in many ways is um, a, a, a real evolution. But what the Russians were doing across the IRA was suppressing some voters, turning out others, sowing racial discord, scaring voters, um, appealing to, to sort of beliefs and personal vulnerabilities. And again, that is something that the KGB as well as the CIA had done in elections all over the world. So what the internet did was allow Russia to to really enhance those tactics, to reach people more precisely, more powerfully, based on who they are and what they believe in, which is a real tradition of electoral interference. But the ideas behind its operation aren't just well well walked, but in some ways we can predict them moving forward because they've been taking place for so many decades in the past. Thanks, David. Um, I think it's all really interesting the way there's the, the common threads there, um, but also the differentiating factors. Um, and I think we'll come later in the conversation to some of the lessons that we should be drawing from, from that evolution. Um, Director Brenner, Brennan, um, you know, David has mentioned here that, um, you know, both the KGB and the CIA um, during the Cold War were engaging in these kinds of operations. Um, but one of the things that, that David's research confirmed is that after the Cold War, the U.S. moved away from engaging in electoral interference. But of course, Russia under Putin has not and has actually, as you've both just elaborated, really doubled down. I'd be interested in, in your assessment of the reasons for that departure and what it tells us both about U.S. thinking on democracy as well as on Putin's own worldview. I think there are various reasons why things have evolved, certainly for the United States. Uh, as you point out, I don't think it has evolved as much for the Russians. The Russians are still very much engaged in trying to manipulate the electoral processes and trying to shape the electoral outcomes. But during the height of the Cold War and in the aftermath of World War II, I really think that uh, U.S. administrations felt that it was an existential threat between from the Soviet Union and that the United States and the Soviet Union were involved in this race to be able to shape the, uh, the, the birthing of a number of countries in the aftermath of World War II. And uh, 
We're working hard to ensure that uh, either liberal Western democracy, democratic systems were going to evolve uh, and to uh, emerge or communist systems. And so uh, I think successive U.S. administrations in, engaged in a lot of the activities, whether it be propaganda or whatever, to try to boost the prospects of governments and uh, political parties and politicians who were sympathetic to the Western democrat democratic model. Uh, I do think that uh, U.S. administrations and the U.S. government has matured in many respects as well in terms of seeing that uh, this uh, exploitation of the uh, electoral system and process is antithetical to democratic values. And certainly when I was in the government and when I was in those circles in the White House situation and wherever else, um, I really believed and argued strenuously against doing anything that is uh, inconsistent with all of those democratic values and ideals that we uh, espoused um, globally. And I, I do believe that the, the truth is more powerful uh, than you know, misrepresenting the, the, the facts. And so I, I believe that, and I, now I'm talking about what the situation was up until I left government in January of 2017. Quite frankly, I don't know what the Trump administration is doing and how it is operating on the global stage. But certainly during the Obama and the Bush administrations, uh, those discussions that I uh, were, was involved in, uh, there was never a, a effort to try to uh, influence the outcome of uh, a free and fair election. We tried to strengthen the ability of governments to hold elections. That's certainly true and trying to increase voter turnout, but not to try to advance the, the uh, interests or the, uh, the potential uh, outcome uh, of uh, one candidate or another. But I, I do think that uh, the, the global situation has changed now compared to the post-World War II Cold War environment. And I'd like to think that, uh, again, up until January of 2017, the administrations that I worked with and for uh, saw that uh, it was best to allow these electoral processes to play out. Thanks, sir. And I, you know, I think it's interesting. David actually writes, um, you know, one of the comments you just made is something that, that David quotes from you in his book as well um, about the truth being more powerful. And, and he notes that um, you were among um, several who were staunch opponents of the idea of using disinformation to counter Russia's own efforts. And I think this is a really important concept because in a lot of conversations um, on the policy side that we hear about countering foreign interference or countering disinformation, I think sometimes the tendency, um, because it's, you know, it's a natural one, is to say, why don't we do the same thing back? Um, and I think that you made a very eloquent and, and really critical point there about how the values um, and principles of democracy really need to be guiding not only our response, but our entire approach to engaging um, on democratic processes and democratic principles. Yeah, I think it's important for the United States uh, to remember that um, we're fighting for uh, our, our principles and the democratic foundations that this country was built upon. And we should never stoop to using the tactics of, of other countries. Um, whether, we're, whether we're fighting terrorism, uh, whether we're fighting the, the Russians, or whether we're fighting uh, fascism, uh, modern day, uh, whether we're fighting authoritarian efforts, I think we really have quite a few quivers uh, in our bow uh, that we uh, can use uh, and not stray from those basic principles and ideals that I think make this country uh, truly you know what it what it espoused, what it aspires to be, which is uh, a beacon of freedom and liberty and uh, one that is built on ideals. And that's why being dishonest on the world stage, being dishonest anywhere, I think is just so counterproductive. And that's why I'm particularly um, uh, dismayed by what I see happening recently. Yeah, I think you know David talks in the book about um, about you know the the Russian goal of sowing discord, and I think particular in the social media space um, and the information warfare space, what we see from Russia is this attempt not only to, to um, you know, sow false narratives and to sow discord, but to actually undermine the very idea of truth. And I think that that's really important, um, a really important point that you just made about the need for us to actually double down on truth um, as something that we are seeking to protect. 
and advance um, and, and not allow it to be undermined. David, on a related point, one of the things that you discuss in your book is why U.S. democracy promotion efforts are different from covert electoral interference. Um, in previous work that I've done, I've laid out three key distinctions, and I'd be interested in your reaction to these. First is that American democracy promotion engages in other countries openly and transparently. Secondly, democracy support is made available to parties across the political spectrum if they are committed to the democratic process. And third, U.S. policy strives to give people a voice in determining their country's future. So in other words, U.S. democracy promotion is about strengthening the democratic process, while foreign interference is actually about weakening or subverting it. Does that match up with the conclusions from, from your book and from your findings? It, it does. And, and I think it also marks a natural evolution of American foreign policy in the sense that, as, as Director Brennan said, during the Cold War, the existential threat was an ideology. So the strategy was to contain that ideology and therefore using covert action to prop up anti-communist candidates or democratic candidates made sense. There was a logical case to be made that that was what we should be doing. In the post-Cold War period, the foreign policy objective evolved to just promoting, strengthening democracy as an end in itself. And one of the people I interviewed for the book was, was President Bill Clinton, who said he much preferred using organizations like NDI, IRI, U.S. democracy promotion organizations to just shore up electoral processes over CIA-led covert action for a couple of reasons. One being that which is public can't be dramatically outed. Like you said, it's open. So, so if, if if no one can say, "Oh, you're caught," well, well, the point is that it's visible. The point is that you know what America is doing. You know what America is 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 doing to achieve its objectives, which is to make sure countries can hold stable, um, free, and 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 fair elections, which contrasts with with the Russian objective, which is to degrade democracy, to undermine democracy. And there is that, therefore, parallel between our objective of strengthening it versus theirs of undermining it all over the world, which I think is also a really important point. Uh, other folks I was able to interview were, you know, the president of Montenegro, whom Russian intelligence attempted to assassinate, um, as well as the, the, the uh, former president of Colombia, who said that his elections are under siege, too, in order to sow discord, to undermine democracy. So, so the reason why, from my perspective, promoting democracy makes a lot of sense in our current environment is because it, it helps to mitigate the effectiveness of the Russian effort to tear democratic systems down by subverting and undermining their elections. Really interesting. And Director Brennan, uh, on the point that, that David just raised about other countries um, that are also facing Russia's tactics, I mean, you know, I think um, in the U.S. we have a tendency um, in our, you know, American exceptionalist way to think the challenges we face are also exceptional to us. Um, but in fact, this is not a challenge that is exceptional to us. Um, you know, Vladimir Putin's Russia has been engaging in these tactics, um, you know, across the European space as well as in other parts of the world. Um, I think just like, you know, David noted at the top that he felt we needed to understand the, the history in which Russia's 2016 operation was uh, was occurring. I think it's also important that we understand the broader global context in which these tactics are are playing out. Um, and, and so I'd be interested in your reflections on both what you've seen in terms of um, Russian interference operations in other countries, um, as well as if we need to be doing more, in fact, to work with our partners and allies, um, just as we would on any um, traditional security threat to really actually put together more of a coalition effort around protecting the sanctity of our democracy. Well, just the way the Russians and Soviets before them tried to influence the outcome of US elections for many decades, as David was mentioning, uh, they've been similarly engaged in that effort on the global scale and the global stage. And I would argue that they are in fact more active in other countries around the globe than they are here in the United States. That's one of the things that, uh, as an intelligence officer for many years, I was looking at and tracking, because Russia really would like to affect the uh, outcomes of elections and, and political challenges in other countries so that they can have in those countries uh, governments and politicians and individuals who are going to be more sympathetic to Russian policy goals and objectives. Uh, I don't think the Russians, you know, like to roll over, you know, borders with tanks and then Russian troops. Ukraine is a sort of a different case. But uh, to the extent that they can, in fact, um, influence the outcome of elections so that they have sympathetic politicians who are going to be in governments, 
so that they can get them to support maybe a lessening of sanctions against Russia, uh, get them to um, support various Russian initiatives in, at the UN or other places. Uh, this is a very, very active Russian effort, uh, whether or not you're talking about Europe or Africa or Asia, to try to, again, influence the outcome of these political either elections or you know, political struggles so that people will rise to the top who are going to either uh, um, by design or just by happenstance be the ones to support Russian um, initiatives. Uh, so uh, Russia uses a lot of different tactics, whether it's uh, money that goes to uh, their preferred candidates, um, sending out propaganda, um, disinformation to denigrate uh, the, the prospects for candidates that they want to lose an election. So it, it's it's very active. Um, we have talked with a lot of our partners uh, over the years. Uh, I was involved in a number of discussions with my foreign counterparts about the types of tactics and practices that the Russians use. So I, I think there needs to be a greater awareness. And I know we're focused on Russia right now, but I, I would say that it's not limited to Russia as far as the opportunities for a number of foreign countries, governments, and intelligence services to try to um, influence uh, the outcome of those uh, electoral um, uh, systems. Thanks. Yeah, that actually is a is a point I want to come back to. Um, what we're seeing from from other um, actors, particularly I think um, authoritarian regimes, um, who find this toolkit to be particularly appealing, um, whether to influence the outcome of an election or simply to undermine and weaken the democratic foundations of their competitors as a means of weakening us from within. Um, it seems to me that this is a toolkit that is um, proliferating, although I think there are some distinctions amongst different actors based on their longer term strategies, which um, I'd like to, to unpack, but we'll, we'll come back to that as in a, in a moment. Um, David, sort of sticking with the, the history point of this just for another couple of minutes, um, one of the interesting conclusions um, for me that you reached is that even during the Cold War, there was a difference in the U.S. and Soviet tactics when it came to covert electoral interference, that U.S. tactics were more rooted in the democratic process itself, even when seeking to pervert it while the Soviet approach was more about disruptive and corrupting activities that had little to do with the democratic process. Um, you wrote that covert electoral interference tactics reflect the characteristics of states that execute them. And in particular, you, you pointed to the different domestic experiences of intelligence agencies. So I'd be interested if you could talk a little bit more about um, why you found that to be the case. Um, and then, uh, Director Brennan, I'm going to, of course, given your, your extensive background, also ask you to reflect on, on this particular point as well. Sure. So, so I, I would say that there are sort of two key differences in the in the Soviet and now Russian and the American approach the, to covert electoral interference. The first, as you both have been talking about, and as we mentioned, is that Russia's moved toward this practice in the post Cold War period, whereas America has moved away from it, with rare exceptions, such as such as in Serbia. But the second core difference um, has to do with, as you said, the systemic objectives and the tactics underlying them. And across time, the Soviet systemic objective and now Russian systemic objective of covert electoral interference is to tear down democracy. The first, the very first Soviet operations to do this sort of thing in 1919 were with the express purpose of Vladimir Lenin to topple democratic systems, to abolish national borders, and create some sort of communist international utopia. The idea was to uh, undo democratic systems through lies, through deceit, through through disinformation, through bribery, through blackmail, through extortion, that, that those kinds of methods that extend across decades. The, the American objective here, the, the, the genesis of CIA covert action to interfere in elections was to preserve a democratic system. It was in Italy in 1948 because Eastern European states had just fallen to communism. Those communists, after winning rigged elections, um, undid their democracy. So Harry Truman authorized the CIA to help the Christian Democrats win in Italy and prevent that outcome. And in those operations that then followed, you saw things like orchestrated voter registration drives, get out the vote efforts, um, you know, making sure that campaigns knew how to reach and influence the masses in effective ways in, in, in campaigning tactics that mirror what campaigns do in the United States. The point was just that the CIA's hand was hidden. Um, 
Whereas when I would talk with, I interviewed a former KGB general, a former Stasi officer, and and what they described was figuring out how to figure out what someone's vulnerabilities were, and to and to basically blackmail them into doing what they wanted in re, in relation to an election, and and that's different than what I found the CIA's approach to be. Um, so even when we were in this game, the systemic objectives, the tactics differed, um, which is just one of the reasons why anyone who, in my opinion, seeks to say that there is a equivalency between America and Russia here is is totally missing missing the ball in, in, in various respects, one of which being that we've approached this idea in, in, in pretty different ways and the lines we've been willing to cross have differed across time. These are really important points. Dr. Brennan, I'd invite you any reflections you have on this as well. I guess we are all though hostage to the prism that we look at the world through. And I'm sure if there's a you know, similar discussion going on right now in Moscow about what happens since World War II, there would be a much different perspective in terms of who was right, who was wrong, who were the good guys, who were the bad guys. Um, I agree with David that uh, our efforts since World War II have been to, to try to preserve and strengthen democracies. Now, I, I do think the United States over the years sometimes has engaged in certain types of unsavory tactics or practices that... Um, you know, were justified because, you know, the end justified the means um, in terms of whether it be disinformation or whatever. Uh, but I, I, I do think that, um, you know, with the Soviet Union's dissolution and the, the real um, <clears throat> evaporation, I guess, of the ideological drive uh, behind uh, Moscow's uh, in global activities, uh, it's much more sort of, you know, realpolitik and that uh, Vladimir Putin just sees oppor opportunities to massage what's going on in other countries, uh, again, to get favorable outcomes. Uh, and I don't think there is a real concern on the part of, of Putin and others about uh, engaging still in these very, very unsavory tactics, whether it be blackmail, intimidation, bullying, or whatever, or even sending money, not just to the candidates you prefer, but to the candidates you don't want, uh, and then expose uh, those monies as, as being tainted. So I, I think there's a lot of dirty tricks that the Russians have engaged in over the years. Um, I'm not saying that it was only the Russians, uh, but I, I would like to think that at least the, the main purpose behind a lot of the U.S. efforts and that the CIA and others were involved in over the course of the last 75 years was designed to ensure that democracy was going to uh, survive and flourish uh, despite that uh, ideological uh, drive uh, that was coming out of the uh, uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union. Yeah, and, and, and Laura, if I could just add a quick thing, and I because I do think, and I agree with what he just said, and I do want to make clear that it is not accurate to say that the CIA has only ever organized voter registration drives and, and turnout initiatives. Um, that is not true. Disinformation was spread by the agency in elections in places like Italy and Chile. In Chile, a failed electoral operation proceeded to coup plotting. Um, there, there are, the, you know, votes were purchased or authorized to be bought again, in pursuit of ends that were purported to be for democracy. So it was, as, as Director Brennan said, a means versus ends calculation. But but this history is complicated and there are exceptions in which um, the CIA did things that I imagine today Americans would, would say are lines that we shouldn't be crossing. And I agree. Thanks, David, for that. But also, to be clear, from your findings, those are activities that were conducted in the past exactly. that are not conducted as far as your research shows today. Precisely. Great. Okay. Um, David, I want to ask you one other question um, that relates to a point you made earlier uh, about both how in the past and, and present, um, one of the goals um, of, of Russia's operations or the Soviet Union's operations um, has been not just getting particular candidates elected, but actually undermining democracy itself. Your book defines covert electoral interference in pretty narrow terms as, quote, a concealed effort to influence a democratic vote of succession. Um, I'm just wondering, though, given what you find in the book, that um, a lot of the efforts that we see from Russia um, are, are not on influencing the outcome of the election per se, but are on fomenting discord as an end in itself and on undermining the very demo democratic process and thereby weakening a country from within. You know, this is consistent with the finding of numerous reports we've seen from other research institutions, my own team, others, as well as from um, the Senate Intelligence uh, you know, Committee, from the Intelligence Committee Assessment, et cetera. 
Um, and Franklin Four actually had a really interesting um, theme to his recent cover story in The Atlantic. Um, and in a quote from him, he says, boosting the Trump campaign was a tactic. Hashtag democracy, rest in peace, remains the larger objective. So I'm just interested in your reflections on whether in some ways we actually tend to think about electoral interference or foreign interference in too narrow a ter of terms. Does focusing just on the electoral outcome as the main goal sort of hinder us from seeing some of the ongoing activities that we, we see happening? So, so I would actually flip it, which is that, so Ford's argument, which I agree with, is that the Russian objective is to, is to transform democratic systems into authoritarian, corrupted versions of themselves, which is precisely why electoral operations matter so much. I, I, I was struck when I interviewed um, Oleg Kalugin, who was a KGB general for for decades, and and he described elections as as a once every four years opportunity, as an irresistible opportunity to manipulate the future of a democracy, to sow doubt about the sanctity of that democracy, and to tear down that democracy. There's there's a reason that there's this practice as a phenomenon that has stretched across a century, which is to target elections. Why the KGB? and now Russia has been engaged in it in, 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 in such consistent and, and really just well-rooted ways, which is that elections are the heart of a democracy. They're what determine the future of the state. They enable progress. They enable order. And when you target those processes and so doubt around whether um, the people who are elected reflect the will of the people, whether the people who are elected are loyal to the people or are loyal, in fact, to the foreigners who help put them in their chair. You're, you're sowing doubt about the very about the very sovereignty of your state. So, so if there's an influence operation that's not aimed at an election, that, that's bad, but it's not existential. Whereas if you are able to, to basically take away the future of a state, to show the world as well as the people of the state that your democracy doesn't actually have a process of succession in which you can believe, that's how you, you destroy a democracy. Because in my opinion, it, the way that democracies die are, are, are to corrupted versions of themselves almost all of the time. And that is what Russia is seeking to achieve. And to me, that is why Putin is so aggressively targeting our elections. Donald Trump, you're right, is a, is a means to an end. His chaotic, disruptive, and, and in many ways undemocratic nature is what Putin likes because it, it helps him to tear down our democracy, which is why I believe that he, he has been so actively supporting him and seeking to undermine, as he did in 16, candidates who, who are harder on Russia and, and more abide by the traditional lines of what it means to be the leader of a well-functioning democracy. I think those are some important reflections. And I, and I certainly, um, I think it, you, you make an important case here for why um, you know, elections are so, the sort of preeminent institution of a democracy. Um, I'd argue they're probably not the only institution that's important and that's under attack. Um, one of my colleagues has a, a phrase that I will um, plagiarize here, which is that um, when it comes to foreign interference, democracy or elections are not um, a starting point or an end point; they're a flashpoint. Um, you know, Director Brennan, the um, you know intelligence community, the Mueller report, and others have now found that Russia's operations targeting the 2016 election you know, started at least back in 2014. David chronicles this in his book with the agents that, that came to the United States. Um, but we also know that in the aftermath of the 2016 election, Russia's social media activity from the Internet Research Agency actually increased pretty substantially um, in, in order to foment discord about the president's election and about support for him. I'd be curious for, for your reflection on this, too, of how we should kind of conceive of ongoing foreign interference um, in the context um, of elections as well as beyond. I think political discord in the United States and in the increasing polarization within the country and the, the fighting among Americans within Congress and other places uh, certainly is something that Russia sees as very favorable to its interests. Because if the United States is focused inward and trying to, you know, resolve these issues or fight with each other, our ability to actually you know, carry out our global responsibilities is undermined. So I agree with, with David, there is an effort to, to really try to ensure that they, the Russians do whatever they can in order to hurt the U.S. ability to be that leader of the free world, to counter Russian efforts globally. And as we have seen over the last several years, unfortunately, Americans are at each other's throats. And you, know, you look at a Congress that is increasingly dysfunctional because of you know, the, 
the polarization and uh, the political fights that are taking place. Uh, that's why in 2016, we saw that the Russians were trying to sow discord within the, the Democratic Party between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. Again, the more that they can agitate and the more that they can you know, stimulate these you know, political and social perturbations within the United States, it, it is uh, furthering, I think, Russia's objectives, which is to try to weaken the uh, America's ability to use its, I think, exceptional capabilities on that global stage. Uh, so I, I do think that over the last several years that Putin has, you know, not just looking at the outcome of the 2016 election, but just looking at what's happening inside the United States, where there is this significant discord that uh, I think is just uh, helping uh, Putin um, as he continues to, to move forward with his agenda. Yeah, and David, picking up on, on one of those points, um, one of the themes in your book, which is consistent with other research on these issues, is the long history of the Soviet Union and now Russia weaponizing race in its efforts um, to sow discord in the U.S., um, to suppress the black vote. Um, I, I would just, especially sort of in this moment in time in which we're in, I'd be interested if you could elaborate on that through line of the, the use of race um, as a weapon. Um, and, you know, if you have any thoughts on what that means for the national security community um, in terms of maybe taking on racism in a more serious way than, than we have today. Sure. So, so one of the things that I was really most struck by in the hundreds of, of KGB archival pages that I that I went through was how often race came up, how often um, the operational objectives the intelligence collected had to do with how to divide Americans ar along racial as well as religious lines to further the goal to which you both alluded with and, and discussed, which is to divide the United States at home and to show the world abroad that the United States is just a, you know, quote, hotbed of hate that is dysfunctional and unenviable and therefore no other country should aspire to be, that in fact the American model is flawed. And, 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 and what the Russian tradition here of interference, both in elections and otherwise, is to prey upon pre-existing divisions and fissures. And in race, in, in the systemic racism in our society, they see a glaring division that is so easy to exploit, to create um, discord um, and dysfunction, and to and again, to embarrass America both at home and abroad. There were staged hate crimes during the Cold War. There were staged you know, letters that purported to show um, extraordinarily racist behavior from Americans that were concocted by the KGB, but was actually, I mean, it was signed by the KKK um, as a lie. So, so what we, what we need to understand, I, I, and I really believe is that when people talk about how to defend our elections, one of the steps we have to take is to confront racial injustice in our society, systemic racism, police brutality, because the more well-functioning a democracy we have, the less divided um, and uh, democracy we have, the less opportunity there is for Russia to not only um, sow division, but also to make us believe that they're not attacking us because a divided society, a polarized society is very easily manipulated and very easily distracted. And, and that again is what Russia is best at exploiting. So in, in a lot of ways, the racism and, and the racial issues that we see in our society in a certain sense, they're they're domestic, but in another sense, they're a real national security problem because they're so easy to weaponize from the perspective of Russia, as the KGB did for for generations before us. Um, so, so I hope that we're able to take steps toward mitigating that glaring vulnerability in our society, which would have the added benefit, of course, of creating a more equitable um, society as well, just for our own democracy. But those issues go hand in hand. And, and, and this is not unique to Putin. Again, when the IRA focused on black Americans, I think it surprised a lot of people. It, it didn't surprise the people who, who know things about Russian intelligence. And it didn't surprise the KGB general I was able to interview who said, of course, that's the oldest trick in the book. That's your greatest vulnerability, your, the racism embedded in American society. So, so this is a long running issue that, that I hope we're able to, to address moving forward. And I, I think David, thank you for that. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and to me, you know, it also points to in this issue set in, in countering foreign interference in our democracy, 
how, you know, our typical stovepiping between foreign policy and domestic policy um, really needs to be torn down, where so many of the steps we need to do to make ourselves more resilient and reduce our vulnerabilities actually starts within ourselves and at home. And another area I think you point to that's both a historical fact and what we saw the IRA and GRU do in 2016 is the use of the traditional media as a megaphone and amplifier for their weaponized information. Um, and the weakening and, and sort of, you know, hyper-partisan media that we see in the U.S., I think, um, at least I would argue, interested if you guys agree, is another area where we are actually making ourselves more vulnerable and strengthening our media institutions um, domestically would also make it more difficult for Russia to be able to successfully use these tactics. Uh, just a couple of, of quick um, questions specific to 2016 before we turn to, to audience um, question and answer. Um, you know, Director Brennan, um, David writes in the book that in 2016, um, the focus on one interference tactic, the cyber manipulation of voter rolls or vote tabulation may have distracted from other threats um, or tactics that Russia was engaging in, the email releases and, and social media. Um, and some of your colleagues um, are quoted in his book, you know, talking about how, in fact, the social media um, aspect of the campaign um, was really not um, identified until after the election, much much later on. So I'd be curious from from your perspective, having lived through this, um, you know, sort of two part question, if I may. Um, the first is as we approach you know the 2020 election, are we at risk um, from your perspective of having the blinders on in any way, of focusing on one tactic, maybe in this case the last battle, um, you know, while missing um, what may be the next you know, the next war. Um, and then secondly, are there lessons um, that you took away from the experience and challenges that the Obama administration faced in dealing with, um, with Russia's interference operations in real time that you think are instructive for how, um, how these kinds of campaigns should be handled in the future? First of all, we've mentioned the IRA several times, and just to make sure that listeners don't confuse the IRA with my Irish relatives, um, that's the Russian Internet Research Agency that we're referring to. Um, and in, in David's book, uh, um, it was always always wonderful to see some former colleagues who were out of government at the time throw darts uh, against those who were in the government at the time of the 2016 interference and say what should have or shouldn't have been done. Um, but I and I don't think uh, that we were distracted um, by focusing on voter registration roles and other things. I think it gets to the point that we really were trying to preserve preserve the integrity of the election, and by disabling voter registration rolls, which we knew the Russians could do, that would have really cast great doubt on the integrity of the election. So there were a lot of things that we were trying to do to prevent any type of technical interference that we knew that the Russians had that capability to do. On social media, this, to me, it's, it's, it is really the most difficult challenge that we faced then and that we continue to face. Because as we see now, we're struggling with what is allowed in social media in terms of truth and fabrications, whatever else. And uh, it's very difficult to determine um, what is coming from abroad and what the Russians are behind. Uh, and the Russians, I think, have, have been really quite uh, capable in terms of taking advantage of the freedoms and liberties that exist within the United States, including a, supposedly a, a free media and press, whatever else, and disguising their activities and masking their activities as being, in fact, from Americans. And so as the head of the CIA, where we focus on foreign intelligence, you know, I, I, we couldn't take a look at what was happening in U.S. social media platforms because that is not foreign intelligence. But it also is very difficult for the FBI and law enforcement to do things because you have to respect privacy and, and civil liberties and freedom of speech. And so this is something that I think the Russians, as well as others, have very, very deftly taken advantage of and exploited to be able to use that very large echo chamber within the, the social media environment uh, to be able to propagate its, its views. It's happening every day. It continues to happen every day. And we see the Twitters and the Facebooks and others really continue to struggle with what they should allow or what, how they should intervene uh, in these activities. 
And unfortunately, I think there's just so much of uh, false information and fabrications that are coming out from domestic sources as well as from foreign sources. So I, I do think that although the tech, trying to strengthen the technical uh, systems within our voting um, electoral infrastructure, I think is important. And, uh, and I think progress has been made there to try to make it less vulnerable to that type of foreign interference. But that social media environment, that information environment, that ecosystem that uh, people can play in so readily and that the Russian intelligence services, again, have just developed a lot of different tactics and practices and tools. That is one that I think we continue to struggle with and we need to come to grips with it. Yeah, this is a hugely complicated issue. And I think this issue that you point to of authorities and the different roles of the intelligence community um, is one that um, is often not understood in the public conversation on these issues. I think it's a really important one to, to lift up here. David, do you want to elaborate at all on, on this finding from, from your book and, and this piece of what you write about? Sure. Yeah, I, I would say a, a core finding of my book um, as it relates to 2016, and it's, it's funny to explain this while, while talking to someone who was, you know, at the table actually dealing with these issues in 2016. But but one of one of the findings is that, as Director Brennan discussed, there are sort of two types of, of electoral interference. There are efforts to alter ballots, to change votes, and there are efforts to influence minds, um, to spread propaganda, which is what the DNC and John Podesta leaks were. That's what the Internet Research Agency social media piece were. And what I found is that the, the glaring vulnerabilities of our electoral infrastructure in the summer and fall of 2016, the access that Russian military intelligence had to those systems was so glaring and so potentially explosive that the overriding policy objective of the Obama team, as explained by, by many of his aides, was to just maintain, as Director Brennan said, the sanctity of the vote, to make sure that the election wasn't disrupted. That's why on election day itself, um, the cybersecurity coordinator in the White House, Michael Daniel, was running a crisis team awaiting some sort of Russian cyber attack because this was a real pro a real hypothetical that could turn into a reality that President Obama and each of the moves he made um, was seeking to prevent by reaching out to states, by having that congressional statement, by considering a critical infrastructure designation. But the other finding in my book is that in focusing on that threat, the problem is that there was no retaliation for the other, the other, or, or, or no, it was easier to neglect or to assume, to say that this is an, an acceptable level of interference in some sense of the email releases and what was understood, which my understanding is was very little of the social media manipulation because of the concern that if you hit Russia for, for that or seek to deter future action, Putin would then escalate toward actually altering the vote. Um, and, and, and what I find in my book is that to secure an election, you need to secure both things. As Director Brennan said, you need to prevent direct vote alterations. You also need to do what you can to, to reduce the, the ability of foreign actors to manipulate your people covertly. Um, I would say the first bucket there can be brought to zero if you secure your systems. But something history instructs is that you will never keep foreign actors completely out of your information environment. Elections are penetrable. That's what Vladimir Lenin saw. That's what Vladimir Putin sees. So what you can do is you could manage these threats. You could seek to, to, to deter bad behavior. But I think it's, a, it's an illusion to say that, you know, if, if not for, for example, Donald Trump, we could really get this problem under control because this attack happened when Barack Obama was the president, right? And he tried to stop it, but it still happened. So, so the point of my book is, in my book, is that you have that addressing those two avenues um, is what it means to secure an election, and what Putin achieved in the interplay between those two in showing what he could do to our vote, while actually manipulating millions of Americans, put the Obama team in a very difficult position in seeking to balance how to respond to those two types of interference at the same time. I just add that. It was especially difficult since one of the major candidates was actively and publicly solicitous of Russian interference, uh, which was you know, a, a stark difference from any previous election in the United States that I'm aware of, where one of the candidates was uh, you know, encouraging uh, that type of uh, interference. Well, and you also had a candidate that was um seeking to sow doubt about the integrity of the process as well, about whether the process may be rigged, which um, of course was also an, of an, inter an interest of the Russians um, to, to cast doubt on the integrity of the process. So 
um, certainly, certainly complicating um, there to be sure. Um, I wanna take a question from the audience. Um, uh, we've got a listener who asked, what would a national strategy um, look like to address disinformation on social media by Russia, China, and other parties. And and I might just add to that, um, you know, one of the analytic conclusions I've reached in my work is that the politicization of foreign interference in democracy is actually one of the greatest barriers to addressing it. And David um, and Director Brennan, you both sort of touched on this in, in your point. So I'm wondering, um, you know, what you think that means about um, any national strategy to address these issues um, going forward, um, regardless of who wins in November? You know, how do we take the political aspects of this out and how do we really build a national strategy to counter these efforts? Both of you, whoever oh, wants yes, to. David. Okay, um, so, so, so I would say in my study of this history, one of the most damaging things that the current president has done as Director Brennan referenced is not only solicit foreign interference, but convince tens of millions of Americans that that foreign interference doesn't even exist, that that Russia isn't doing what we know Russia is doing. Because in doing that, what he has done is made this a partisan issue. He said that if you believe in this issue, then you're just trying to help the Democrats. When in truth, this is anything but a partisan issue. I mean, again, what history shows, who did the KGB target in the 1960 and 68 elections? Richard Nixon, a Republican in the 1976. 1984 elections. They targeted Ronald Reagan, a Republican. It just so happens that now they like a Republican, but they don't like any one particular political party. What Russia likes is the person who advances Russia's interests, and that's not America's interests. So in, in the future, what I hope, I mean, this will not happen under our current president, that is clear, but the next president has to do what is possible to remind Americans that even if Russia's helping your person, it is a national affront, it's offensive, it's undermining the very notion of what it means to be a sovereign democracy, and we need to come together to unite against it because any response to this threat has to have the buy-in of the people because so much of what it means to manipulate an election is manipulating people. Because if you release emails and you focus on the gossip in the emails rather than the source, you're being played. If you're on social media and you're not focusing with a discerning eye on the quality of the content before you and just taking in what you see, again, you're being played. Other countries have come to grips with that, like in France, their population, when Russia tried to post something similar was much more discerning and saying, we don't want to let another country determine our leaders. But in America right now, not only have we not figured out how to address the threat, we haven't even agreed that the threat exists because of what's happening under our current president. And that is so profoundly unfortunate and in disalignment with the past where, by the way, two American presidential candidates during the Cold War would have, were approached by Soviet ambassadors offering to help them get elected. And the immediate reaction of those candidates was, get the hell away from me. I want nothing to do with this. This is offensive. And if I win, if I lose, I do not want the help of your government. We, we need to get back to that attitude. And I was just so disappointed to see the Congress pull out a provision that would, that would force in a bill um, campaigns to report offers of foreign help. Because if we can't even do that, then I don't, I don't know what it even would mean to defend an election if we're basically saying we want foreign interference in our elections. I think that the... Unfortunately, the Congress is such a dysfunctional cesspool of partisanship these days that there's really very little chance that it's going to be able to address this in a bipartisan, fair, uh, and significant way. Um, you know, after the 9-11 attacks and the stand-up of the 9-11 Commission, uh, an independent, congressionally mandated um, commission, it, it came forward with a number of recommendations that really put partisanship aside because we recognized that this really was a serious threat to U.S. national security. I have long argued and have lost my arguments uh, for a stand-up of some type of commission, um, really focusing on the cyber environment because I, I am very concerned about how uh, troublemakers, whether it be you know Russians or Chinese or you know criminals or whomever, are going to be taking advantage of that digital environment to advance their interests. And I think it's the challenge of the 21st century. I don't think our government and our nation has come to grips with it yet. And I really would advocate for there to be some notable uh, members of uh, in both parties, as well as businessmen and uh, technocrats and, and uh, futurists and engineers and others who are going to come together and, and look at what is in the realm of the possible and not have a partisanship lens uh, really govern what they're going to advocate for. 
but this is something that I think is going to take quite a while, you know, maybe a two or three year commission because uh, it is just so, so complicated. It's the, it was in my portfolio when I was at the White House in terms of Homeland Security, the cyber part that was in that portfolio. And it is what made my head hurt most. And as we have talked uh, already, uh, the Russians and others are taking full advantage of that environment. And we struggle as a nation to try to figure out exactly how we're going to deal with it and mitigate those threats without trampling upon those principles of, of liberty and, and freedom, speech and, uh, and privacy. It's a tough question. Yeah, it, but a critically important one and potentially um, maybe an area where if we can be humble enough to actually learn from our allies, we may be able to, to do some of that. Um, the European Parliament actually just established its own special committee on foreign interference and democracy um, that uh, is just getting stood up right now. Um, our, our allies in Australia have had um, a special committee both on foreign interference and on social media and disinformation. So um, maybe our allies um, can can do a little bit of the legwork for us if we're humble enough to, uh, to actually listen to, to some of their recommendations and learn some lessons from them. Um, I want to turn to another question from the audience, um, which is about the, uh, on the question of actually cyber intrusions into election systems, what, um, what would be the resources really necessary to protect those systems? And what are the impediments to, to getting this type of investment together? And it, it really builds on um, some of what uh, Director Brennan was just saying on the um, gridlock in Congress, where we've seen some pretty significant battles over um, attempts to get additional funding for election systems, um, where we've seen numerous um, bipartisan bills that have been introduced, whether the Secure Election Act or others, that would have put in place some higher standards for uh, cybersecurity of election systems um, that have really just died on the vine. Um, but interested in, in your thoughts um, uh, to, to either of you on, on you know, what we really need to do on that investment side and, and, and how we actually get there. Let's start with Director Brennan. Well, I think as we know that uh, the voting uh, systems are really the preserve of the states. And in 2016, we had a real devil of a time uh, trying to ensure that some of these states and, and governors and others were going to take the appropriate steps and measures necessary to try to strengthen to the greatest extent possible the, the voting systems, the electoral rolls and other types of things. Uh, and so, uh, again, this is something that, you know, ideally it would be the focus of congressional hearings and discussions and debates and looking uh, at how we're going to resource as well as try to strengthen those systems. One of the things that I'm very worried about, though, are the, I think, rather blatant efforts to suppress votes in a variety of states uh, because of political objectives that uh, individuals might have. And you know, it, it, we really should be trying to facilitate to the greatest extent possible the ability of every American eligible to vote to vote. And, you know, the, a lot of the, the false narratives out there about how write-in ballots are going to be, you know, so manipulated. Uh, again, this is just an effort to, I think, suppress votes that could be, you know, a threat to uh, some uh, individuals as well as to some parties. So uh, again, while the Congress is at each other's you know, sort of throats here, it's difficult to see the way ahead. I'm just hoping that with the new administration and a new attitude that there's going to be a, a real effort to try to bring bipartisanship to these very critically important national security issues and to uh, not to continue to fuel these divisions that exist that I really do think thwart our ability to address these challenges uh, effectively. Yeah, and just sort of on that note, um, you know, another question from the audience is, um, you know, what should we be most aware of as we approach um, the election in November? And Director Brennan, I think you just highlighted some of those those really key issues. Um, David, I'd be interested if you have any um, thoughts thoughts on that particular question as well. Sure, I, I would say I'm watching for a couple things between between now and November. Um, the first is how, again, breaking these operations into those two tracks. The, the first is how Russia will seek to manipulate 
Americans um, into supporting Donald Trump, opposing Joe Biden, or just into pitting them against each other. Um, those tactics are always evolving. Last time it was stolen emails and social media manipulation, but that was just the latest episode and a very long story. What What's certain is that if they if Russia does try to manipulate people, it will be updated tools, um, new means, um, building on pre-existing ideas. So I think we should watch out for that. I think when we get to election day itself, the question persists of whether Russia will seek to disrupt the vote, um, either to try to affect the outcome or perhaps more plausibly, just to sow doubt around the legitimacy of the vote, whether that be by causing chaos at polling places um, or, or otherwise. And I worry that we're more vulnerable to that sort of attack because of the coronavirus, um, in which there's already so much doubt built into whether people will be able to vote safely, securely, and fairly, um, that, it, that, it, that it makes it so that only the slightest disruption, and again, Russia loves to take advantage of pre-existing weaknesses, um, could, could provide one candidate, um, the incumbent, with, with fodder to say, you know, that this wasn't actually fair. Um, the, the, the last thing I'd say I'm watching out for um, is contingency planning. Um, electoral operations don't end with single elections that that never really lines up historically. There's always continuous engagement, continuing interference in the nations you're targeting. Um, as was mentioned, Russia started targeting the 2016 election um, in 2014 um, to sow discord and hurt Hillary Clinton. They intended to continue to undermine Hillary Clinton after the election had she won. So were Joe Biden hypothetically to win, I would be watching for how Russia will continue to engage in our politics. I think it would be dangerous to presume that without Donald Trump, this sort of thing will just stop because what history really clarifies is that it, it, it started long before Donald Trump and that Russia will continue and other actors will continue to try to manipulate our information environments, our electoral processes, once Donald Trump is no longer a part um, of the American political system. So I think a real myth right now is that this has everything to do with him. Um, and, and I think it's important to dispel that because this challenge isn't going away regardless of who wins in November. Thanks, David. I think that's such an important point um, that we've really got to remain focused on. And for all the reasons that Director Brennan laid out of how complicated these issues are, um, something that we we really all need to be very focused on, um, that this is a problem that's not going away and that we really need to focus and commit to, to addressing it. Um, we've reached the point in our program where there's time for only one last question. Um, so I'm going to just turn to this question of other actors. We've, we've alluded to it several times and um, I would just love um, some final reflections, whether in the context of November or more broadly, how um, you both, starting with Director Brennan, are thinking about um, other actors. David's book really focuses on Russia in particular, but um, what, are you, what are you seeing? We hear a lot from, um, from the administration about, about Chinese interference operations. We've certainly seen them do things on Taiwan, in Australia. Um, what are the, the things that are, are most concerning to you about, about other actors? Well, I think uh, the Chinese, as well as others, you know, the Iranians, and, uh, have uh, tremendous uh, cyber capabilities, number one, uh, whether you're, not, you're talking about trying to interfere technically or you're trying to do it through social media influence operations. Um, but but also, uh, I, I think there is, a, a, if you look at some countries around the world, um, they have, they're very astute followers of U.S. politics. And it's not just at the presidential level. We've been talking about the presidential elections. But, you know, senators and members of, of the House of Representatives also have very strong views on certain issues. And as a number of these foreign actors, you know, may be, you know, aiming to try to um, get some of these individuals out of office as a way to enhance their prospects for a better treatment by the Congress or whatever vis-a-vis -vis those, those countries, whether you're talking about sanctions on Iran or, or uh, tariffs on, on China or whatever. Um, and, but and just make a final point, since it's a final question, uh, you know, democracy is pretty messy. And I think it's become even messier over the last 240 plus years since you know, the founding of our country. And um, there are a lot of things, aspects, we've been talking about electoral interference and the Russians and cyber, but there are other things also that I think you know, tend to fuel some of these problems, whether you're talking about some of these campaign finance laws or gerrymandering or, or other things. Um, and you know, we, we want to make sure that just the way the, the national and international ecosystems have, have really evolved and grown and changed over the last 240 years, then we need to be rethinking some of these democratic principles, not to move away from it, 
But what do we need to do in order to strengthen and ensure that the principles of democracy are going to be able to thrive in this technologically driven 21st century? And I think too many people are holding on to past practices, and it's really difficult to change systems. And that's why when people look at the United States and all the problems we have now, you know, and then they compare it to maybe places that have an authoritarian leader, whether it be China or wherever, Russia, that that strongman model uh, seems to be more attractive to some of those people who really are resistant to change. So I, I do think the types of things that we're talking about in David's book, that's why I think it's very important that David was able to put what happened in 2016 into a historical context and perspective. I think it's time that we really need to take a step back and look at what we need to do in order to ensure that this American experiment is going to continue to thrive and is going to be able to deal effectively with the challenges that we face, both domestically as well as internationally. And it's, it's something that I think uh, it can be our legacy to future generations to at least get back on a productive track as opposed to the one that we're on right now. I think that's so well put. And, you know, especially in the context of the current moment where we're seeing globally a democratic backsliding and resurgence of authoritarianism, really doubling down and, and updating and modernizing our democratic principles um, and practices is just so core to winning that competition. So I think that's really, really great points um, from, you know, from you to sort of end on. David, any final thoughts here? No, I think that about covers it. I, I, I would just say again, thanks to you both. I, I, I really can't imagine two people who know more about these issues and who have lived through these issues and who study these issues. And, and this has just been so fantastic. So thanks to you both for reading my book, for discussing these issues with us and, and, and for being here. Really, it's just wonderful. Well, thanks to you, David, the author of Rigged, America, Russian, and 100 Years of Covert Electoral Interference, um, and to, to John Brennan, the former CIA director, both for, for joining us here today. Thanks to all of our um, viewers for, for joining us uh, here for this conversation um, this evening. We encourage you to order a copy of David's book through your local independent bookstore. Um, and thanks again for, for joining us um, and have a great night.